Hi everyone, I'm Sherry Matthew, founder and CEO of AI Technot, and welcome to our business track, How Can Business Adopt AI? I'm joined by amazing speakers today, and we'll be discussing how your businesses can actually adopt AI. We'll be having some questions from some of in the chat box, so if you have any questions that we need to address, feel free to uh, post it. Uh, but at this stage, I want to pass over the stage to Sophie Gray. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Shirin. And hopefully all of you can hear me uh, from my home here down on the south coast near Brighton. Um, firstly, just to acknowledge, I hope you've all enjoyed hearing today from the speakers about uh, their hands-on experiences with artificial intelligence um, and the underlying technology. Now, in this final session, as Shirin said, we'll be looking at how you can actually address um, how businesses can adopt artificial intelligence. Um, first, we'll be taking a look at the market opportunity, um, and then we'll be introducing a framework, uh, not specific to Microsoft as an organization, but a framework that may help you tackle um, the adoption challenges that you face with AI. I'll then be welcoming um, back to uh, the stage, um, Shirin and two virtual guests as referenced there, um, Heather and Didham. So just firstly, um, taking, I guess, a, a little look about um, the history of artificial intelligence, not to go back too far in time. But as we know, the concept of artificial intelligence has been around for centuries. And it was back in the 1950s where the true possibility of this was actually explored. There was a generation of scientists, mathematicians and philosophers, and they all had the concept of AI. But it wasn't until one British uh, polymath, Alan Turing, suggested that if humans use available information as well as reason to solve problems and make decisions, then actually, why can't machines do the same thing? So as we fast forward a very long time from then to 2020, no doubt that everybody in the audience today has had varying experiences with AI, whether you be a consumer of it, um, a developer of it, um, or a leading driver of the exploration of AI within an organization. In 2020, there are two big trends, though, that dominate the market. Firstly, the democratization of AI, AI no being longer exclusive to subject matter experts, and AI being accessible and present for all in their everyday working lives. And secondly, the industrialization of AI, where we address the reusability, the scalability, and the safety of AI which can help drive the acceleration of its adoption and growth. If we take a little look at Gartner's four-year prediction for AI, we can actually see the revenue expectations for AI within the public cloud. And the strong expectation that there will be in the actual number of projects that are going into deployment, which is a consistent challenge that organizations can face about getting these projects into production. Despite the global impact, um, Gartner also reported that 47% of artificial intelligent investments were unchanged since the start of the pandemic. 30% of organizations actually planned to increase such invest investments um, and increase their innovation. And also only 16% had temporarily suspended their AI investments. Just 7% had actually deceased them. During the pandemic, um, for example, AI actually came to the rescue, and certainly we saw this at Microsoft. I think chatbots became the big thing that was um, actually helping um, answer the flood of pandemic-related questions. Um, computer vision started to help maintain um, social distancing, and machine learning models were actually indispensable for modelling the effects of reopening the economies. And all of these technologies are still obviously very, very present today in the world that we're living in during the COVID crisis. It is anticipated that within these four years, we will see about 70, and to between about 70 and 90% of all initial customer interactions being conducted or managed by artificial intelligence. We'll see product development could increasingly be undertaken and tested by AI. AI is likely to be deployed across all government organizations and, and legal systems, only actually having to um, have human intervention to the most complex of cases that require human judgment. We'll see more autonomous driving and vehicles will start appearing in many more cities around the world. And intelligent assistants can now be managing large parts of our lives from travel um, through to planning to the compiling of information that we need prior to a meeting. And certainly we see that today through not only Microsoft's innovation, but lots of other cloud vendor providers uh, technology. 
But as we do know, there are significant barriers to the adoption um, of actually taking on artificial intelligence into an organisation and into our everyday lives. Some of the top challenges reported are the security and privacy concerns of the subject of AIs, so the person that the AI or organisation is actually about, the complexity of actually deploying those AI solutions where there is a high legacy infrastructure, and the complexity of existing data sets in organisations, maybe the quality or the siloed nature of those particular data sets. I'm going to hand over to actually my colleague, um, Daniel Kenyon-Smith, and Dan is one of the cloud transformation leads at Microsoft. And Dan has great experience in the world of what we personally refer to as the cloud adoption framework and how that relates to the concept of data and artificial intelligence. And like I said, this is a relatively abstract model that we'll be taking a, a look at here, not specific to Microsoft or as an organization, but hopefully some of these principles will help you think as business leaders within an organization about the journey and process that you need to go to. So Dan, over to yourself, please. I just want to spend the next few slides talking about the framework um, that you can use to successfully adopt cloud and AI with inside your business. So Sophie mentioned, uh, my name is Dan Kenyon Smith and I lead a team of cloud solution architects um, in our customer success business here in the UK. So Microsoft used this particular framework, um, but like I say, it's not specific to Microsoft um, and it's what we call the cloud adoption framework for adopting cloud and adopting Azure. From Microsoft perspective um, and obviously AI um, in your businesses and basically it's a proven set of guidance that's designed to help you create align and implement your business and technology strategies um, to help you be successful in the cloud it provides some best practice documentation you know tools for cloud architects IT professionals business decision makers um, in order for you to achieve that successful blend between short-term and long-term objectives for your business. The pur purpose of the framework is to balance between speed and agility, and at the same time, give you that control and confidence to be able to adopt the cloud and AI. So it means you need to be agile um, and align your people, process, and technology to ensure that you achieve those business goals uh, with efficient and comprehensive um, guidance to deliver the results that you want for your business within the guardrails of control and um, sustainability. Um, the overall sort of structure of the cloud um, adoption framework is aligned to what we typically see a customer cloud journey. And it's not linear, um, it's a process um, of a cycle that repeats itself as the cloud adoption for your business evolves. So if we start with something like uh, the uh, definition of your strategy, first of all, everybody needs to be aligned to why are we moving to the cloud? Um, if it's the answer is um, because we were told or because the board agreed it or because the CIO or exec, exec level um, told us that we need to move to the cloud, then it's unlikely that the business will achieve the desired um, outcomes. So some of the triggers that everybody needs to be aligned to could be things like you've got a data center exit, could be a mergers, acquisitions, a reduction in capital expenses, it could be an end of life for a mission critical application or technology, cost savings, um, optimizations, increasing business agility, you know, scale into new market demands. There could be a whole raft of reasons, um, but you need to make sure that everybody is aligned with that defined strategy. Uh, the next uh, thing to think about is to plan. So you need to make sure that your plan converts your aspirational goals of your cloud strategy into an actionable plan. Um, you can use that plan then to guide both of your technical teams and your business strategy. Um, you can use this um, to drive things like assessments, to be able to rationalize what you have on premise and what that might look like in the cloud, building things like skills, readiness plans, and identifying any gaps and capture any concerns from the team to make sure you're taking everybody onto that um, on the same journey. Um, from a ready perspective, that's about getting your sort of landing zones, as we call them, in place. So think of a landing zone as um, building a new town or city. You need to get all of your pipes in. You need to get the electricity in. You need to build the roads. You need to get everything in place before you build the first house. 
um, in the cloud. The landing zone is getting the networking in place. It's getting all of the, the relevant designs and architectures in place. And then the first house is actually your first application that you move into the cloud. So that will then allow your uh, migration or cloud native applications to, to scale um, and you won't hit any, uh, any adoption sort of blockers. Um, the next one is around adoption. So how are you going to migrate your first workload onto that landing zone and then increase that velocity using best practices and innovating um, you know, your existing workloads or new workloads for, for cloud native. And then obviously you have to wrap that around governance. So governance is that iterative process. Um, so if you have existing policies on premise, um, then you just need to you know, complement those policies for the cloud uh, to make sure that your you know, estate, your business changes over time and the cloud governance and process and policies also adopt and change over time as well. Um, as far as managed is concerned, um, it's just having that plan in place for reliable, well-managed operations for your cloud solutions. So that's the high level sort of overview, I guess, of, of the cloud adoption framework. Just wanted to talk through a couple of sort of examples um, of customers that we've worked across. There's a couple of industries here. Um, so just wanted to mention a couple of examples across these two industries so thinking of things like predictive maintenance in manufacturing um, helps you determine you know if a specific component you know might fail um, and therefore you can obviously order or replace that component before it actually does and therefore reducing the amount of downtime for that that particular part of the business or for that particular machine um, as Sophie sort of briefly mentioned obviously healthcare in the current environment things like digital um, assistance uh, using things like chatbots, natural language, conversational experiences to help answer things like standard questions, constantly then training your models to answer new and common questions that are coming through. Um, you know, and I say, given the current situation, we're seeing, um, you know, a huge demand for, you know, digital assistance to, to accelerate across many industries, not just healthcare. Um, so that's, 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 that's all I wanted to say. So thanks very much for everybody's time. I'm going to hand back over now to Sophie to lead the uh, panel discussion. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dan. I think everybody can can hear me there. So I appreciate that was a little bit of a whirlwind tour there, um, covering, I guess, some of the main adoption challenges and I guess one approach that you could take with it. But we wanted to, I guess, cover that relatively quickly to make sure we had time for a really good panel discussion. Um, with Shireen um, Didham and Heather, who have real hands-on life experience you know, tackling the adoption of AI within organisations. Um, so firstly, Didham, are you perhaps um, happy to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Sophie. I'm Dita Amin Atish. Uh, I lead Data AI for Accenture's Microsoft Business Group in Europe. Wonderful to be here. And prior to Accenture, I was with Microsoft. This is kind of a reunion for me. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Didim. And Heather, yourself. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Um, yeah, so my name's Heather Dorr. I'm UK Head of Data at UST Global. Um, and we're, um, we're in the process of, well, we're building a data practice based out of Leeds. So, um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both. And Shirin, I think most people now are, are probably aware of, of yourself as well. So, I want to, I guess, split this panel discussion into, into three main pillars and um, covering the topic of business, culture, I think, and technology challenges that you may face with the adoption of AI. So I guess we've had, a, I guess, some pre-conversation through this. And I know you, like I said, have a wealth of experience in this industry. Just what are some of the biggest challenges that you've seen either people or organizations that have faced with and adopting AI? Thank you so much. So if you actually, they are, they are very much aligned with what you presented in the beginning. We at Accenture have done extensive research in, on businesses adoption of AI. Actually, the latest one was just last December. And what we found are the top three reasons. One is employee adoption, uh, very related to strategy and culture. The second one is seeing ROI of these AI investments which is related to you develop a POC, but if you can't scale it, or if it stays in just one department, one silo, then there is no success. And the third one is structure and uh, actually AI ethics as well. So it all ties up to people, culture, and, and aligning on the strategy, which in my humble opinion is, is all responsible AI. So that's why we are passionate to start from um, 
giving comfort to the people uh, that AI is, is, is an amazing technology and to, to everyone's benefit. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And Heather, just how about yourself, I guess, a top line? What's sort of some of the biggest challenges that you have seen today? Yes. Yeah, so, so just to add, the, add to that, really, <clears throat> sort of having worked within large enterprises and sort of run my own startup and such like in the sort of data space and, and AI space, I think one of the big, biggest challenges at the moment um, in business and certainly within enterprises for, for some enterprises is just the awareness of just how port, important it's, it is and it's going to be within the next few years for the, you know, for, for that enterprise to successfully adopt AI, given the pace to change from disruptors and the like. Brilliant. And, and I guess, you know, we've got a number of different business leaders here and really thinking, I guess, at the top level at that business angle. I guess, William, if you were to give any advice to sort of CXO type leaders today, what, what should they think about? Where should they start, I guess, with all of this? Because we've covered a broad framework, but what sort of, where would you start in terms of getting that, that kind of foundation right? <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. So we try to keep it extremely simple. Uh, basically, we call it data AI journey to cloud. And the first thing is to, if you're a large enterprise, then that data modernization, data migration is critical. And if you're a smaller enterprise, then having the right structure, right data strategy is critical. The second horizon, as we call it, is about adding AI powered capabilities. So these capabilities can be AI driven sales, AI driven supply chain, operations management, whatever is critical for that organization in that point of time. Obviously, post COVID, supply chain is a big focus, as Dan mentioned. And the third horizon, which is, is very exciting for all of us in the industry, is what we call intelligent enterprise. I personally love autonomous enterprise, where humans and machines work coherently together, where the, the organization is taking care of itself, of course, managed by humans. So that is the journey we, we uh, usually take our clients through. Yeah. And, and, and Didim, just, just tell me a little bit more there. You referenced, I guess, you know, adding AI to business processes, which is sort of kind of augmenting that process, I guess, rather than fully automate. How do you take customers through that journey to assess, you know, what could be a good business process to, to enhance with AI versus actually ones that we shouldn't touch? What type of experience should you be taking your business through to, to understand to do that assessment? <laughs> So we have uh, various frameworks depending on the uh, urgency for this. So the most important thing is, of course, the industry scenarios. We are, I mean, Accenture's strength, I should say, is to bring in the industry expertise, know how together with the right technology. So uh, obviously, in this maturity of this uh, of this technology, it's critical to, to understand what are the uh, challenges and opportunities in a vertical industry. And within that, the client's specific use cases. So for a process, it could be, um, if we are talking about sales insights or sales intelligence, for instance, maybe uh, this client or this organization wants to increase revenues to make sure or predict their sales in this crazy period that we are in. So that's where we, we start, very much focused on the industry needs and then the client's specific use cases because uh, having a POC here and there does not help scale. We are very, It's about infusing AI with, uh, with the employee's adoption and low Low-code, no-code, I know we'll discuss this a bit, but low-code, no-code also plays a huge role in that. And, and did it, how, would, how would you, I guess, get to a point where you know AI has actually been successful, I guess, in that? So, you, you know, you set your mission by the sound of it, you set your goal. How are you going to understand whether AI is doing what it needs to be doing within that? As, as with everything in business, measuring. I am measuring, setting the right success criteria, the right success metrics, and making sure it's the employees, not just management, as, as Dan mentioned earlier, and measuring that progress for everything. Every use case, AI, AI implementation will say, okay, here is the uplift in whatever the objective was, and measuring that over, that, over a very uh, well-defined timeline is key for success. Yeah. And, and you referenced a little bit um, there about the intelligent enterprise as well. What, what, what's your sort of yeah. definition, I guess, of the intelligent enterprise for the audience here today? 
So we start off in the second horizon with infusing AI across, adding AI-driven capabilities. So the end goal, the vision, and I'm personally very excited about this, is, of course, infusing it so successfully that the whole organization is becomes autonomous and becomes like an ecosystem, a living system, as we call it at Accenture, rather than a department there using some AI and another department there using automation and so on. So it's actually everything needs to come together. And of course, with responsible AI, with humans uh, managing it. So uh, it's a bit difficult to describe in a short panel, but I would strongly recommend our human and machine uh, book, uh, basically written by our leaders in technology called Doherty. Uh, fascinating book and it really is all about actually autonomous intelligent enterprise brilliant thanks to them and heather obviously you, you spent um when we spoke before sort of over 20 years i guess um sort of in the in the data world and have seen lots of different i guess organizations approach this we now sort of move on to more of a, a technical perspective what should some of the that maybe the more technical leaders here i guess be, be thinking about uh, when adopting ai um well one of the key things i think um, and we spoke about it when we discussed before, we've spoken about it already about the, the number of proof of concepts that happen. And, um, and you know, quite often well, at the moment it can be, you know, the proof of concept shouldn't really be the end point uh, of, of a project, you know, a project, a, a data and AI project. It should really be the beginning of how you're going to take that, if it's a, hopefully a success, successful proof of concept, how you're going to take that through to production. And that comes in, I mean, that's a, a combination of people and culture change along with the techno technological changes you know how are you going to take what you know what could be some python script or whatever and take it into production state and you know and that bring, takes us into machine learning ops and other aspects you know um which uh is the next step from devops through to through to um what well, is the successful productionization of, of ai um th those kind of techniques so that that's that's one area i think ml ops yeah, and we, um, it's interesting. It was, it was promising to see that Gartner was reporting that there was a higher expectation in the next four years of projects actually getting into production. I know certainly from a, a vendor perspective of Microsoft, we spend a lot of time in that, that kind of proof of concept stage and, you know, really dying to get, I think, you know, projects into production, I guess, to help achieve that business transformation. We, we spoke a little bit, I guess, previously about the sort of data maturity curve, I guess, you see kind of organisations go on. What, what, what does that kind of mean for you, I guess, in relation yeah. to AI? And I spoke about this this morning as well in, in my, my earlier presentation. So, it depends. I think that you've got the data maturity curve within, within uh, well, it's, you know, you start at one end in terms of the data drudgery and then you move through progressively to become sort of an AI butterfly and it's all very lovely. You know, there, there's hard work in between there and, you know, you have to, the key thing is recognising to start with any company, any business, recognising where they are on that curve and also, you know, where do they want to get to? Because maybe not every company wants to be an AI butterfly, you know. So so what's your goal? What's your endpoint here? And then that comes, you know, brings in your, your requirements really for a data strategy if you don't have one already. And as we've been discussing, you know, your data strategy can help really provide you the roadmap for what you're going to do both technologically and culturally to get from a to b uh, along the, the maturity curve and um you know and what will drop out of that as well are the key sort of business objectives that we've also mm -hmm. spoken about the 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 areas that can that can show the business that you know the, the given business the benefits of working in this way and you know should hopefully bring across that that, that meshing and that that um the sort of cult you know the full-on cultural change that takes an organization to become completely data-driven yeah, I like that data mesh. <laughs> Official data mesh from yeah. about the other day it was uh, interesting. But well, I suppose I'm going to come to you. I not not give you a break. We'll be at the end of the day. I know that we're exhausted. But um, you know, data silos, um, data quality. These tend to be some of the the challenges, I guess, that you know people are facing, particularly in organisations. I guess have a, a, a legacy IT system, but there are also sort of more startup, small organisations at the event today that will no doubt still have, I guess, some of these same challenges. I guess only just to kind of experience or guidance from yourself about, again, where to start maybe in terms of tackling those silos, you know, tackling that data quality sort of issue. Yeah, um, 
Absolutely. So uh, first thing we've got to realize is AI value chain is pretty complicated. If you, if you look from start to end, there's that leadership, then there is that designer element where you need the uh, business analysts, uh, service uh, designers, you need architects. Then eventually you need data engineers and data scientists. And I think uh, this really needs to embed as a mindset and a culture. And when you are actually trying to sort of leverage uh, the power of AI or embed AI as a technology, you really got to understand, are you, do you have a problem statement? What's the value chain? What is the ROI? And I think uh, you got to start from maybe a top-down approach in this case, where leaders really drive the vision and the business purpose and try to solve a problem. If you really don't have a problem, you don't need to start. Simple as that. And... Uh, any organization who's actually making a start in terms of AI, they need to really think through all of these, probably the steps, the frameworks, and obviously all the data, AI, uh, regulatory, and ethical and responsible barriers. How can you overcome all of that? So I think it is pretty much like uh, uh, Heather mentioned. It's, it's, it's a mesh. Leadership, uh, technical uh, capability over here, various verticals, various capability that we need to manage. And the, and the idea is you really need to ensure that someone is really architect architecting this and owning this. Someone really is designing this for your organization, really understanding the organization's capability, where they stand. So as Didam, you mentioned, we need to understand where is their maturity level. So based on this, we really need to adapt all these moving parts. And 80% of the projects fail because there's lack of data. And the other projects who have data, they still fail because they don't have a designer or they don't have a vision. So I think all of these are equally important parameters, in my opinion. Yeah. It's, it's slightly, um, it's so just disappointing to think that projects fail due to lack of data when there's been such an explosion of data in the world and actually some people have far too much data and go and go the other way yeah. so kind of I guess this, this mesh concept you know it does really sound like it's built upon that kind of final pillar I guess um coming back to, to culture and I was uh, I was actually reading a, a really interesting article it was actually by by Gartner again just about the kind of accountability that certainly you have to put in terms of the individuals within your organization around um, you know, taking responsibility for the data and um, thinking through and through how does this relate back to, to, to business value at all times thinking about business value and not data for data's sake. So I guess maybe, um, Didim, you mentioned, I guess, a little bit earlier in terms of kind of low code, no code and citizen developers. And I guess that kind of concept, it comes back to people, doesn't it? And skills. What's been some yeah. of your experience in that cultural element? Of it, yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of cultural elements, both my experience at Microsoft and also Accenture does prioritize the leadership taking very concrete steps to embrace their um, employees, um, help them, give them comfort that this is good for the company and individuals as a whole. So. Those are the most successful organizations in, in terms of adopting AI and not just adopting it, but scaling it, making a true uh, differentiator out of it for themselves in their in their industries. So my suggest our suggestions would be, first of all, to really sit down, take the time to slow down, to speed up. Why would, let's say, a finance department in an organization could benefit from using AI? Um, maybe it's forecasting that people hate to do every month, every quarter, whatever it is. And that AI piece will help free up some time, uh, both from the finance teams and the sales teams, so everyone will be happier and doing their own core competence. So, Making that explanation, giving that comfort is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. it, we, let's say, in the midst of AI and excitement and all of this, may, may think that's obvious to everyone, but no, it's not obvious. The elephant in the room is usually people's fears that they will lose their job, they will lose their teams, and what happens next? So they don't want to adopt it for very natural humanistic reasons. So that's one thing. The second thing is is uh, low code, no code. So I would recommend especially small, medium enterprises and of course large enterprises as well to look into these platforms like Power Platform or UiPath and so on very, very seriously because all of these platforms are offering 
incredible tools to create citizen developers of of, of our employees. So uh, and it's a very fulfilling uh, upskilling from an employee's perspective. In other words, if I am able to create a robot or a bot for myself to do the let's say not so fun task during my day, I'm a happier person, and the organization has actually used, used AI to improve themselves as a whole. So there's that long tail of tasks that can increase productivity incredibly uh, significantly, and yet it's a low, low cost way of adopting AI. So uh, we are very excited about the, the future on, in the low, low code, no code space. Okay, so yeah, thanks for that, Didim. And, and I suppose what, what can come with that, I think it's great because you, you drive obviously that kind of, you know, speed and acceleration, I guess, of innovation. It's really empowering, I think, for people in an organisation yes. to, to do that, really, which is great, and particularly from sort of job satisfaction. I guess maybe coming to you, Heather, a little bit on the flip side, though, is obviously by doing that, there can be implications, as we know, around the responsible AI kind of yeah. concept. So I guess from just some of your experience, you know, being kind of you know heavily involved in sort of customers in the field, what's the kind of approach that, you know, our business leaders here today would need to be really thinking about where do they start? I think that's just it. It's, it's, it's having the awareness of, I mean, the low-code, no-code options are fantastic for, for how they empower, you know, citizen data scientists and, 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 and others. There's, as we... It's you have challenges, though, of course, it's like, for example, you know, bias in data can have massive implications on the machine on associated machine learning models. And, you know, AI, the associated AI, for example, can appear prejudiced, racist in, in, you know. And so it's for me, it's having that holistic view of of, you know, the it's ensuring that the, the all the tools that are available to, to, you know, empower people, which is fantastic and actually really quite fundamental to for you know an organization to affect change uh, in this space having those tools but but also having that awareness of of the risks and that the tools can do so much for you but um and and I, I don't mean to I'm not trying to sort of upplay these but you know they, they they're very important and that awareness of um you know come it, it relates to ethics and it relates to um equality and you know diversity um, diversity of developers, for example, in AI. Yeah, so I mean, it's, um, you know, we, we've actually put a, in Microsoft, just for our kind of own internal, I think, process, we have sort of an ethical AI committee, which is actually quite an interesting kind of starting point, because what it forces people to do is come together across the business and actually, you know, put a topic to the forum to talk through and come to a conclusion about how we approach it. And I think, you know, definitely, that type of approach, it gets people talking, it gets people thinking about it, um, and it gets people kind of agreeing the best approach. You get different perspectives on it. Yeah. Because I suppose let's face it, none of us necessarily know what the right or wrong answer is, I guess, to to you know the, the kind of AI use cases, I guess, in the in the real world. So yeah, certainly I, I suppose an ethical committee um is certainly something that we can work quite well. But just, I guess, a kind of a, a final point for me almost before we wrap up. Um, I guess I've mentioned an ethical AI committee there. What that tends to be is a grouping of people, both certainly the business um, and IT coming together, as well as subject matter experts. And in this kind of pre-discussion, we spoke about, you know, shadow IT and the challenges of that. I guess kind of any thoughts, you know, in terms of, again, the adoption of AI, I guess where that can kind of pose a challenge and I guess how we, we try and address that. If I Sorry, Heather, go ahead. Um, I'm probably going to say quite some of the things. So, so I mean, I was going to say, you know, shadow IT can. Well, I, I was talking about this earlier. Shadow IT can be very effective, but um, and I, you know, I, I've led a shadow IT teams in a number of different organisations. But, um, but that said, you know, but, but that said, it's I see it's more effective when when the IT, you know, when the IT teams and and the business teams work together. That's far more effective. You know, you. Shadow IT happens because of the need, and, and then you know it's so that that communication between the business and IT. If you can, you know, reach out and have those conversations, and it's hard because you know there are, there are very many reasons why, why it can be hard. But but what I see now, it can be most effective when when you know when linked and that communication is taking place and people are working together. Yeah, I suppose it, it's it's that consistency across the organisation that feels so important when it comes to the adoption of AI. All, all of the different, like we said, the people, the process, the yeah. technology 
coming together collectively. And I guess that potential shadow IT, they've got to be involved in that and, you know, become part of that single messaging, I guess, to drive it. So It's, it's the recognition that, you know, the IT guys have uh, some great skills, as do the business, they have the skills and knowledge and bringing, the, bringing them all together is, is yeah. the best place to be. Absolutely. Sorry, Didim, you were going to... Um, uh, it's all along the same lines. I, I was just going to say, I mean, in order to make AI inclusive and bring up all the concerns, all the risks uh, equally and properly, it, we that's why we need involvement and embracement from all parts of the organization. And that's why I'm personally very excited about low-code, no-code, because that is the way to democratize AI. I mean, if more employees are able to understand, oh, okay, this isn't rocket science, actually, I can do this as well, then they will raise their hands when they see some issues or risks, etc. So uh, I think it will all come together, but we do need to uh, make sure we, we uh, comfort people and we embrace all the, let's say, feedback and join forces as one industry, not just big organizations or this, but governments, educators, you know, industry. So thank you, uh, Sharon, for hosting this panel as well, not, not, not only. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So look, we're, we're about time to, to wrap up and, you know, thank you. Thank you both for joining um, today and I guess giving us some of your perspectives and appreciate, Heather, you did a, a longer session earlier in the day. So yeah, shameless plug, I think, for that. For <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess kind of if we kind of wrap up, I think so what I'm hearing is like a reference consistency. I think thinking about a framework, what your own framework looks like for success, I guess, across an organization, really relating that back to the business goals, the business objectives and the priorities. But don't let it, I guess, the, the kind of technology challenges you have, I think, hinder that innovation, because I guess if you don't get moving, you won't know what insights and value you can bring and therefore what data you may already have and data you may be missing and just making sure that you're aligning those people um, and the culture within that organisation to it and really holding people, I think, accountable for um, for that. And as a result, let's take the adoption of AI, according to Gartner. Certainly in the next four years, we'll see a lot more moving, moving into production. So um, I'm going to hand back to Sharon. And like I said, thank you very much to both of you. Um, and Sharon will be wrapping up the day for everybody. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you yeah. Sophie. There's one question that I just want to address. Um, so someone asked, uh, how can we provide business case when they have lots of data and lots of huge challenges and how can they find relationships? So I'll quickly um, give my response to that. Um, I think it, it depends what your data is all about. And I think you probably got to start with a simple data analysis. Really want to see what your, what's your problem statement here? Are you trying to use that data to sort of um, understand your customer or engage with, with your customer? So engagement could be one particular benefit that you want to get out of it. Other thing could be, it could be operational data where you want to sort of optimize the way you're operating or using your particular um, pipeline or supply chain or anything in that case. Um, if, it's, if it's simple uh, uh, optimizations or transformation, uh, such as fraud detection or anomaly detection, is pretty much what that data could potentially do. So really, the use cases are do you need to empower anything or do you need to transform anything or optimize a particular operation? Uh, does anyone else want to add anything onto that? I, I couldn't agree more with it. And I think back to Didham's point for me, it's all about them measuring it. Because yeah. if you have an ambition to increase your customer sac satisfaction to 97% as an example, yeah. um, what have you got to do to get there? And data might just be one component and process might be. See, so yeah, I couldn't agree more that it all comes back to those three core pillars. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's infusing across the process rather than just one yeah. uh, touch touch point. It's really looking at the whole improvement. Of yeah, agencies. absolutely. And I think it's that hypothesis, like what could social analytics along with your transactional analytics can give you. And I think that, exactly. that, that's the feedback loop. So I think discovering that and finding that sort of data is, is really uh, useful in this case. No, I think, I think that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you for the, the insightful discussion. Um, and with this, I think we'll come to the closing part of the session where I'm just going to give a quick roundup, if that's all right with everyone.